Édouard Daladier French, Edouard de Lage, the 18th of June 1884 to the 10th of October 1970, was a French radical socialist, i.e. centre-left politician and the Prime Minister of France at the start of the Second World War. Topic: <laughs> Career. Daladier was born in Carpentras, Vaucluse, beginning his political career as town mayor in 1911 before his election as parliamentary deputy in 1919. Later, he would become known to many as the Bull of Vaucluse because of his thick neck and large shoulders and determined look, although cynics also quipped that his horns were like those of a snail. During World War I, he rose from private to captain and company commander. Daladier became a leading member of the Radical Socialist Party, and was responsible for building the party into a structured modern political party organization. For most of the interwar was the chief figure of the party's left-wing, supporters of a governmental coalition with the SFIO Socialist Party. A government minister in various posts during the coalition governments between 1924 and 1928, he was instrumental in the Radical Socialists' break with the Socialist Party in 1926, the first Cartel des Gotches, left-wing coalition, and with the centre-right Raymond Poincaré in November 1928. In 1930 he unsuccessfully attempted to gain socialist support for a centre-left government alongside the Radical Socialist and similar parties. In 1933, despite similar negotiations breaking down, he formed a government of the Republican left. In January 1934, he was considered the most likely candidate of the centre-left to form a government of sufficient probity to calm public opinion amidst the revelations of the Stavisky affair corruption scandal. His government lasted less than a week, however, falling in the face of the riots instigated by the far right. With Daladier fell the coalition of the left, initiating two years of government by the hard right. After a year withdrawn from front-rank politics, Daladier returned to public prominence in October 1934, taking a populist line against the banking oligarchy he believed had taken control of French democracy, the 200 families. He was made president of the Radical Socialist Party and brought the party into the Popular Front Coalition. Daladier became Minister of National Defense in the Léon Blum government, retaining the crucial portfolio for two years. After the fall of the Léon Blum, he became head of government again on 10 April 1938, orienting his government towards the center and ending the Popular Front. While the 40 hour working week was abolished under Daladier's government, a more generous system of family allowances was established, set as a percentage of wages, for the first child, 5%, for the second, 10%, and for each additional child, 15%. Also created was a home mother allowance, which had been advocated by pronatalist and Catholic women's groups since 1929. All mothers who were not professionally employed and whose husbands collected family allowances were eligible for this new benefit. In March 1939, the government added 10% for workers whose wives stayed home to take care of the children. Family allowances were enshrined in the Family Code of July 1939 and, with the exception of the stay-at-home allowance, have remained in force to this day. In addition, a decree was issued in May 1938 which authorized the establishment of vocational guidance centers. In July 1937, a law was passed which was followed by a similar law in May 1946 that empowered the Department of Workplace Inspection to order temporary medical interventions. <laughs> <laughs> Munich Daladier's last government was in power at the time of the negotiations preceding the Munich Agreement, when France backed out of its obligations to defend Czechoslovakia against Nazi Germany. He was pushed into negotiating by Britain's Neville Chamberlain. Unlike Chamberlain, Daladier had no illusions about Hitler's ultimate goals. In fact, he told the British in a late April 1938 meeting that Hitler's real aim was to eventually secure a domination of the continent in comparison with which the ambitions of Napoleon were feeble." He went on to say, "...today, it is the turn of Czechoslovakia. Tomorrow, it will be the turn of Poland and Romania. When Germany has obtained the oil and wheat it needs, she will turn on the West. Certainly we must multiply our efforts to avoid war." But that will not be obtained unless Great Britain and France stick together, intervening in Prague for new concessions but declaring at the same time that they will safeguard the independence of Czechoslovakia. 
If, on the contrary, the Western powers capitulate again, they will only precipitate the war they wish to avoid." Nevertheless, perhaps discouraged by the pessimistic and defeatist attitudes of both military and civilian members of the French government, as well as traumatized by France's blood bath in World War I that he personally witnessed, Daladier ultimately let Chamberlain have his way. On his return to Paris, Daladier, who was expecting a hostile crowd, was acclaimed. He then commented to his aide, Alexis Leger, Ah, les cons, morons. Topic: Rearmament. Daladier had already been made aware in 1932, through German rivals to Hitler, that Krupp was manufacturing heavy artillery and the Duxieme Bureau had a grasp of the scale of German military preparations, but lacked hard intelligence of their hostile intentions. In October 1938, Daladier opened secret talks with the Americans on how to bypass American neutrality laws and allow the French to buy American aircraft to make up for productivity deficiencies in the French aircraft industry. Daladier commented in October 1938, "...if I had three or four thousand aircraft, Munich would never have happened," and he was most anxious to buy American war planes as the only way to strengthen the French Air Force. A major problem in the Franco-American talks was how the French were to pay for the American planes, as well as how to bypass the American Neutrality Acts in addition. France had defaulted on its World War I debts in 1932 and hence fell foul of the American Johnson Act of 1934, which forbade loans to nations that had defaulted on their World War I debts. In February 1939, the French offered to cede their possessions in the Caribbean and the Pacific together with a lump sum payment of 10 billion francs, in exchange for the unlimited right to buy, on credit, American aircraft. After tortuous negotiations, an arrangement was worked out in the spring of 1939 to allow the French to place huge orders with the American aircraft industry, though, as most of the aircraft ordered had not arrived in France by 1940, the Americans arranged for French orders to be diverted to the British. Topic. World War II When the Molotov–Ribbentrop Pact was signed, Daladier responded to the public outcry by outlawing the French Communist Party on the basis that it had refused to condemn Joseph Stalin's actions. In 1939, after the German invasion of Poland, he was reluctant to go to war, but he did so on 3 September 1939, inaugurating the Phony War. On 6 October of that year, Hitler offered France and Great Britain a peace proposal. There were more than a few in the French government prepared to take Hitler up on his offer, but, in a nationwide broadcast the next day, Daladier declared, We took up arms against aggression. We shall not put them down until we have guarantees for a real peace and security, a security which is not threatened every six months. On 29 January 1940, in a radio address delivered to the people of France entitled The Nazis' Aim is Slavery, Daladier left little doubt about his opinion of the Germans. In his radio address, he said, For us, there is more to do than merely win the war. We shall win it, but we must also win a victory far greater than that of arms. In this world of masters and slaves, which those madmen who rule at Berlin are seeking to forge, we must also save liberty and human dignity." In March 1940, Daladier resigned as Prime Minister in France because of his failure to aid Finland's defence during the Winter War, and he was replaced by Paul Reynaud. Daladier remained Minister of Defence, however, and his antipathy to Paul Reynaud prevented Reynaud from dismissing Maurice Gamelin as Supreme Commander of all French Armed Forces. As a result of the massive German breakthrough at Sedan, Daladier swapped ministerial offices with Reynaud, taking over the Foreign Ministry while Reynaud took over Defence. Gamelin was finally replaced by Maxime Weygand on 19 May 1940, nine days after the Germans began their invasion campaign. Under the impression the government would continue in North Africa, Daladier fled with other members of the government to Morocco, but he was arrested and tried for treason by the Vichy government during the Riome trial. Daladier was interned in Fort du Portolet in the Pyrenees. He was kept in prison from 1940 to April 1943, when he was handed over to the Germans and deported to Buchenwald concentration camp in Germany. In May 1943, he was transported to the Itter Castle in North Tyrol with other French dignitaries, where he remained until the end of the war. He was freed after the battle for Castle Itter. 
Topic: <laughs> Later life. After the war ended, Daladier was mayor of Avignon from 1953 and member of the Chamber of Deputies from 1946, where he acted as a patron to the Radical Socialist Party's young reforming leader, Pierre Mendes France. He opposed the transferal of powers to Charles de Gaulle after the coup of 1958 but, in the subsequent legislative elections of that year, failed to secure re-election and withdrew from politics. He died in Paris in 1970 and is buried in the famous cemetery of Père Lachaise. <laughs> Daladier's first ministry, 31 January to 26 October 1933 Édouard Daladier, President of the Council and Minister of War Eugene Penancier, Vice President of the Council and Minister of Justice Joseph Paul Boncourt, Minister of Foreign Affairs Camille Chautamp, Minister of the Interior Georges Bonnet, Minister of Finance Lucien Lamarou, Minister of Budget Francois Albert, Minister of Labor and Social Security Provisions Georges Legs, Minister of Marine Eugene Fro, Minister of Merchant Marine Pierre Cott, Minister of Air Anatole de Monzi, Minister of National Education Edmund Mielet, Minister of Pensions Henri Coyle, Minister of Agriculture Albert Saro, Minister of Colonies Joseph Paganon, Minister of Public Works Charles Daniello, Minister of Public Health Laurent Einick, Minister of Posts, Telegraphs, and Telephones Louis Serre, Minister of Commerce and Industry Changes 6 September 1933 Albert Saro succeeds Legs d. of September as Minister of Marine. Albert de Limier succeeds Saro as Minister of Colonies. <laughs> Daladier's second ministry, 30 January to 9 February 1934 Édouard Daladier, President of the Council and Minister of Foreign Affairs Eugène Penancier, Vice President of the Council and Minister of Justice Jean Fabry, Minister of National Defense and War Eugène Fro, Minister of the Interior François Pietri, Minister of Finance Jean Valadier, Minister of Labor and Social Security Provisions Louis de Chapadillain, Minister of Military Marine Guy Le Chambre, Minister of Merchant Marine Pierre Cott, Minister of Air Aimé Berthaud, Minister of National Education Hippolyte Ducos, Minister of Pensions Henri Coyle, Minister of Agriculture Henri de Juvenel, Minister of Overseas France Joseph Paganon, Minister of Public Works Émile Lisbon, Minister of Public Health Paul Bernier, Minister of Posts, Telegraphs, and Telephones Jean Mistler, Minister of Commerce and Industry Changes 4 February 1934 Joseph Paul Boncourt succeeds Fabry as Minister of National Defense and War. Paul Marchundo succeeds Pietri as Minister of Finance. <laughs> Daladier's Third Ministry, 10 April 1938 – 21 March 1940 Édouard Daladier, President of the Council and Minister of National Defense and War Camille Chautamp, Vice President of the Council Georges Bonnet, Minister of Foreign Affairs Albert Saro, Minister of the Interior Paul Marchundo, Minister of Finance Raymond Patinotra, Minister of National Economy Paul Ramadier, Minister of Labor Paul Reynaud, Minister of Justice César Campinchi, Minister of Military Marine Louis de Chapadillain, Minister of Merchant Marine Guy Le Chambre, Minister of Air Jean Zay, Minister of National Education Auguste Champetier de Ribes, Minister of Veterans and Pensioners Henri Coyle, Minister of Agriculture Georges Mandel, Minister of Colonies Ludovic Oscar Frossard, Minister of Public Works Mark Rukart, Minister of Public Health Alfred Jules Julian, Minister of Posts, Telegraphs, and Telephones 
Fernand Genton, Minister of Commerce Changes. The 23rd of August 1938, Charles Pomeret succeeds Ramadier as Minister of Labor. Anatole de Monzi succeeds Frossard as Minister of Public Works. The 1st of November 1938, Paul Reynaud succeeds Paul Marchando as Minister of Finance. Marchando succeeds Reynaud as Minister of Justice. The 13th of September 1939, Georges Bonnet succeeds Marchando as Minister of Justice. Daladier succeeds Bonnet as Minister of Foreign Affairs, remaining also Minister of National Defense and War. Raymond Patinotra leaves the cabinet and the position of Minister of National Economy is abolished. Alphonse Rio succeeds Chapadilane as Minister of Merchant Marine. Yvonne Delbos succeeds Zay as Minister of National Education. René Bess succeeds Champetier as Minister of Veterans and Pensioners. Raoul Daughtry enters the cabinet as Minister of Armaments. Georges Pernet enters the cabinet as Minister of Blockade. See also Interwar France French Third Republic 6 February 1934 crisis End notes <inaudible>